50 or 100. I mean, it, it's just, it's really easy with a single machine for IT to go ahead and do that. And then I think on the other side, for the actual clients, um, you know, we now have one environment where you can actually make kind of shop floor real-time operator systems. And then also you can make kind of reporting dashboards and you can make stuff that maybe would sit in a big TV screen over the shop floor, kind of just informational displays. So being able to have all of those different types of displays being made in one environment, again, it's just, it's just super easy. You don't have to go out to two or three different environments. Um, so I think that's really easy. And then the fact that I can build one screen and that screen can be on you know, a desktop, it can be on a Microsoft Surface tablet, it can be on a phone, um, but I don't have yeah. to build a special screen for each one of those. So I think all of that together, it just makes deploying and getting this mm -hmm. data and these screens out to people just so much easier. Yeah, uh, That's what excites me about it. That's cool. No, I, that's, that's exciting for sure. And so what, just to get these out of the way, kind of what are some of the, the common misconceptions people have about like what it takes to actually, you know, upgrade to, or even do a new install with it? Um, just to kind of table set there. Um, I think the upgrades, um, what's really nice in 2.1 is you can actually install it straight over um, the 2.0 release. Mm -hmm. So if you already have a server out there that's 2.0, you can upgrade to 2.1. Um, another thing that really is kind of a nice trend is, you know, every year it seems like software, you know, ends up taking up more resources. Um, the nice stuff is in 2.1, it actually has now reduced the amount of resources that we have. So the nice thing is after an upgrade, you're actually going to get, you know, more performance out of your exact same machine. Um, so that's kind of a nice thing um, about these upgrades is that you can do it right in place on top of the other one without having to uninstall or get a new machine. Mm -hmm. And then you're also going to get these little kind of performance boosts also after the upgrade. Nice. Yeah. And, and one question we often get is like, what should people know who are worried about like limiting interruptions or protecting data during the upgrade process? Yeah. So I think what's it called? I mean, the great part about having a single server that, you know, can feed all of your clients and you just have to go ahead and upgrade it once is, you know, during that upgrade process, your clients aren't going to have that server. So I think <laughs> obviously making sure that you schedule this at the right time and you're, you're well protected. So I think, you know, obviously exporting your projects before the upgrade, Mm -hmm. um, is an important thing to do. Um, and then I think really that ability to do that in place upgrade um, that we've done is is also really handy. So just make sure you upgrade or back up your projects. There's an export function that you can do, mm -hmm. uh, which works really well. You're not going to have to, your projects will actually all be there when you just do the in place upgrade, but that's just a, you know, just for a little bit of insurance. And then I think the other side of that is um, with 2.1, there is an upgrade that happens in place. And I was actually surprised um, the installs and upgrades pretty seamless and it actually goes pretty quick. Nice, nice. Uh, well, it, I'm gonna ask you one more question before I let you get into the uh, presentation. But, you know, yeah. so what what are some of the things, you know, that, that this adds to the capability that operators will be able to do that they can't do now, you know, that are that are part of, part of the feature set here? So, so OpsHub, I think when it was first released, we really had this ability to kind of connect up to any data source um, and build a new screen. And and that was great, right? The ability to go in and build a new screen um, that's web native, HTML5, right? But basically the idea is that screen you can publish anywhere. That was great, but a lot of people had existing screens um, or they had built out you know, some stuff in, you know, whether it was iFix or in, in Plan Apps or Simplicity. So now what we actually have in 2.1 is we actually have the ability to build a screen in your iFix environment using what we used to call web HMI. But basically, there's if you use a certain set of graphic objects, you can actually build that screen and it will publish natively into OpsHub. So now you can actually kind of leverage your existing install and your existing screens infrastructure to now publish out content there. So that's nice. And then we actually do have in there, we do have an alarm summary object. So you actually can go ahead and look at all your active alarms and then you can also build trends in there too. So it just lets you kind of leverage your existing um, projects now instead of so you can complement net new with that existing content. Awesome. Well, Will, do you want to share uh, with us some some of your presentation there and then we'll, uh, we'll get to Greg's uh, demo part as well? Absolutely. Yeah. So I've got about 20 minutes. Um, I'm going to present this as if there's some people here who maybe um, are really, you know, experienced with OpSub and they'll kind of get some of the new content at the end. Someone who might not be as experienced is just kind of thinking about it. Um, there'll be some content at the beginning that's kind of an overview. So let me ask, Jeremy, is my screen changing? Can you see the yes. new? Yes, it is. Looks good. Okay. 
Yep, so I'm gonna kind of go through an overview and then I'll also go through the 2.1 features. I've actually just added in the 2.1 SIM1 feature. So that'll actually be a nice little thing too because that's actually coming out right on the heels. I think it's at the end of the month um, as we just moved into August. So, so this is really the power of OpsHub is the idea of, you know, you know, we all kind of went mobile there a couple of years ago with our phones and everything else. And now the idea is how can we do that securely on the shop floor um, and allow people to actually be getting information they need at the right time with whatever device they have. Um, so that's kind of the idea and the dream here. Um, and this is what we've kind of want to do is we're calling it kind of the connected worker, but you know, even if it isn't a tablet, it's how can I get this on my, you know, my PC, my desktop, how can I also get it onto a big end on display? How can I get it casually to someone in the front office who only wants to look at it sometimes? How can I maybe get a display into someone in the lab or quality department um, who just wants to look at certain values, um, right? And you know, how can we actually do that easily? So in the past, it's been pretty difficult um, to build for all of those different environments with one tool and actually have the performance across all of those um, different use cases. But now with OpsHub, and a lot of it is OpsHub, but a lot of it is just the technology, the bandwidth we all have, the devices we all have, the touchscreen capable devices. I mean, so we're kind of leveraging all of those changes in technology, but now we're really actually allowing people to build out, you know, very, very easy, very flexible, very quick custom solutions here to kind of meet every single person in the organization. Um, so some of the stuff, like when I talk about this, um, you know, how it is very easy to do. Um, what this is kind of talking about is, you know, I can actually, this is the environment where you're actually looking at building a screen um, and how you build that. And the nice thing is you can drag and drop and you can actually just move things around very quickly and easily and format stuff. We have a whole bunch of widgets, as you can see here, that you can drop on. But then there's some cool stuff like up here at the top where you can actually say this exact same screen if it's on a desktop, I want it to show certain features that, you know, now I have a lot of real estate. And then with the exact same screen, you can say, if I detect that the client is a tablet, I want to show it slightly differently. And if the client is a phone, I want to maybe just take out some of these features. So it will really actually let you build one screen and actually have it so that when the client is opening it up on a tablet or a phone where you have less real estate, it will actually show maybe less content or just highlight certain things. Um, so it does make it a lot easier that you don't have to have one project for desktops, one for tablets, one for phones. And then when you make a change, you have to sync up all three of them. It really is just the same display for all three. So that kind of flexibility is really handy um, as you can do this. The other thing that's pretty cool is if you actually have a browser that is set for a different language, um, oftentimes the actual display will actually just show up in that language. Um, so you don't have to build one in English, one in Spanish, one in French, one in Portuguese. Um, you know, it'll actually just work so that depending on what the browser settings are, the application will actually open in that language. So that also makes it a lot easier to maintain your, maintain your screens. Um, if you haven't seen it, the other nice thing about this is there is a web server there that actually can publish this content. So as clients actually open up and go in, they're actually just hitting a, a website, a URL. Um, it doesn't have to be external, right? It doesn't have to be published out to the internet, um, but internal to your own network, it would be a website, which is cool. But the other nice thing is you can actually develop in that exact same URL. So instead of having to have a development environment and then publish screens out, you're actually able to just log into that same website and five or six different people could be logging in and all developing screens and apps at the exact same time. So once you start doing this, you're like, wow, we used to have five or six different people each had their own client and they all developed separately. And then we would merge the projects or do things like that. But now it is really just seamless that everyone can basically just go ahead and log in and do that. And then the nice thing is you can just immediately test your code and it looks the exact same. So through the same URL, you can build a screen, test it in runtime and go back. And then you also have with that, you know, if I do have five people developing at once, the other side is I want to make sure that, you know, people aren't overwriting each other. So you do have this ability to kind of check in and check out projects um, that you're working on. So other people can't get access to it um, while you're working on it. So there's these padlocks that you can actually lock in there. So that's another nice, another nice feature. 
Um, and really the idea here is we call them apps, but instead of having one big project and certain people would have to go to certain screens, if you have somebody who is maybe just a plant manager who just wants to look at some overview stuff, you can build a set of five screens and call it an app with its own URL, so its own address, and you can just point people to that. So if you wanted to, if the quality manager wanted a certain set of screens, you could build out something specific to them. You could also train them and let them build out their own. But the nice thing is with one web server, it's not one project. It can be five or 10 or 15 different projects um, that you can have. So for different personas or different people, you know, you can actually just have different projects for each of them. Again, it's just the idea that this just makes it very flexible and then very easy to maintain. Um, so here's what we were looking at is when we started, we were like, okay, we, you know, we're obviously just focused on manufacturing companies, right? And utilities. So if, if we're looking at all of the data that they have, you know, some of the data is SCADA data or PLC data, some is MES data or quality data, some is historian data, could be our historian or someone else's historian. Some people have custom database applications that they've used for maintenance or for other things. Um, you know, sometimes they'll have external data, sometimes they even have a cloud um, based data source that they want to go get access to maybe from their suppliers or maybe what the weather content is or what next time they're going to get rain. But the idea is how do I actually connect up to all of those? And part of this that gets tricky is all of these actually use kind of different technologies to talk to their applications. So, you know, us, we use kind of OPC um, to talk to our SCADA environments, right? But a lot of the business applications actually use SQL databases and they use SQL. And a lot of the modern applications right now are finding that it's a lot easier and a lot less maintenance in the long term to actually build something called a REST interface, which allows you to go into and basically ask a question of an application and get it back. So you could say, what's the weather going to be like in Cincinnati for the next seven days? And they will actually give you back that answer. Um, so that's called a REST interface, um, which is really popular for business applications. So sometimes there's a SQL database back there, but they put a REST interface in front of it to allow you to ask that. But basically the idea is we wanted OpSub to be able to talk to all of these different sources. So if you wanted to build one screen, it has some data coming from the cloud, some coming from a custom SQL application, some coming from Historia, and some coming from SCADA. You could do that seamlessly by just making these different types of um, connections. And really that's what you end up with, right? You end up with the ability that it's kind of seamless to the, to the operator. And some of these data points can be coming from custom applications, some from SCADA, right? Some maybe from the electric energy usage, right? Um, database that you have. Some could be from the quality lab side um, where some testing goes off to the lab and it comes back and they post what the latest test results are, right? But the idea here is you can kind of mash all of that up onto one display and it really is seamless um, about where that data is all coming from. Those are kind of all of the all of the different functions we have. Uh, we also have a use case where people are actually going through and building out a central control room um, where they want to be able to have, you know, maybe sites that all have their own systems. And then maybe during off hours or maybe during nights and weekends, they want to control them centrally. Um, because they're unmanned, but basically how can I actually go through and get that data securely in there? And then how can I build an application in here that actually allows me to kind of monitor all of the different sites from one central place um, is really kind of another nice use case um, where we can actually have this set up um, for, you know, the central control. And another nice thing that we have is Right now, we have kind of two SCADA packages. One's called Simplicity, one's called iFix. Um, if you know, we have a way to actually publish those iFix screens or those Simplicity screens out as kind of a thin client using something called WebSpace. So I can actually install a WebSpace server and feed out that same screen to 10 clients without installing the software out of those 10 machines. The nice thing is we've actually built an interface so you can actually host WebSpace right inside Operations Hub. 
So I could centrally be up here and I could say, I wanna go look at the screens for this site too. And it will actually automatically pass in your login credentials and let you see those screens there. Or you can say, you know what? I just got an alarm from site three. Let me go pull up the actual application for site three. So you don't have to rebuild your applications. Um, so that's right now set for simplicity and they're working on it for the iFix side. So it should be coming shortly here for iFix also. So this is kind of another thing that we've been, we've been really focusing on is how to allow um, Operations Hub to work better with all of our products. And that's what I kind of mentioned is, you know, we actually have all of these native plugins to our historian data for trends where you can actually go through and pull up data for trends. We have that web space connectivity so you can actually pull up your existing simplicity and very soon iFix screens right in your system. And then we also have that web HMI content, which I'll go into, which allows you to build a screen that's going to be HTML5 native and then actually publish that and host it into um, OpSub, where you'll be able to have, you know, HMI type screens, PNID type screens, and then also have alarm summaries and also have trend objects built right in there. So again, we're really trying to build it in so that if you do have the rest of our portfolio, you know, you can actually really get quicker time by leveraging the content that you've already built. But if you do want to build custom content completely new in OpSub and you're a newer customer or you just have some dashboards that, you know, are getting data from a bunch of different sources, you can also do that. Um, another thing that we've done and kind of gone to is we have a, a product called Plan Applications, which is an MES product, which means manufacturing execution system. So imagine if you have a manufacturing plant, this really helps you go through and figure out what products you can make, helps you design and actually make those products. Um, so it actually says, go ahead and start making this product on this machine, gives you, you know, visibility into your inventory. So lets you see, you know, do I have enough parts and raw materials to make my parts? Do I have a lot of parts that are halfway through being assembled and made? And then also it helps you go ahead and kind of set up your quality. So when I finish this part, what should it be like? What are the specifications for it? Um, so imagine like your limbs or your quality lab, basically being able to test those parts and make sure they meet the requirements for that part and that we can ship them. So that's what our MES product is. And with that, we've actually built a whole bunch of new client displays that are right inside OpSub. So now when you actually upgrade you know, that product, you're now going to get a whole bunch of displays that are native to this environment that you can then also build custom content on, but you actually have this ability to just use these screens that are kind of what we call out-of-the-box screens. Um, so if you are an MES customer, um, you know, you would know that, or if you're an integrator or someone else who's kind of interested in that, you know, you can ask us more questions. But the idea here is we're actually building a whole bunch of out-of-the-box content um, that natively sits right inside Operations Hub. And then the nice part about that is we would give you these displays that have a whole bunch of functionality, but if you wanted part of those displays, you want to make your own custom one, we actually let you take pieces of those displays and basically what we call widgets and actually make your own display. So you can still either use the full display as we have it, or you can take the pieces and parts from it and actually build your own display. But if you wanted to, it would automatically show you some of that functionality that we had um, built into our product. So this is kind of showing you a little bit about what it actually looks like uh, and how you actually go ahead and, and set that up. And Greg's gonna be doing a demo later where he'll actually show you kind of how those widgets are built onto the screen and things like that and how a, how a screen is built with some of the new objects. So this again shows you a little bit more of, of you know, how you could actually build that out. And again, we have that breakout session. So if you have more questions about some of this, um, certainly we can go into more detail then. But the idea here is you know, we have one layer of visualization in Operations Hub, which could be looking at our manufacturing data, our SCADA data, and our historian data, and, you know, kind of giving you one view, one holistic view of, of your operations. All right, so now we've got, I've got a couple more minutes just to kind of go into some of the new features here. I'll quickly highlight them, and then Greg will actually go through and, and demo some of these. Um, so what we've kind of had in the latest release, and I kind of mentioned this, um, you know, we're basically making it easier to configure screens 
We've also got performance improvement. So the amount of RAM it takes, how quickly it starts up, how many clients it can feed, all of those numbers are going in the right direction. So the amount of RAM it takes is actually decreasing. Um, we used to have, you know, whether it was 16 gigs of RAM or something now, we're able to run systems with eight gigs of RAM. Um, you know, and then also the number of clients who can actually hit this. I mean, these numbers are, are absolutely huge, right? So if you do want to set up a central enterprise ops hub and feed a bunch of clients, um, or you want to give out apps to a whole bunch of different users, you don't have to worry about, you know, running out of bandwidth on your machine or running out of resources on your machine, having to set up a second server. Um, it really does scale beautifully. So those are some of the features. And now some of the things that we kind of have um, that we did in 2.0, Right, some of these different things, language packs for different languages. Um, we actually will show you some of these control limits um, that you can actually go through on our trend, right? And then obviously, you know, moving moving a screen between apps is something that a lot of people had asked for. Uh, being able to connect directly up to OPC UA. So there's some PLCs out there now that speak OPC UA natively, so you could get that directly or iFix or Simplicity actually speak OPC UA so you can get, you know, this is how you can browse and actually go ahead and stick data from those SCADA systems and SCADA servers right on your screen. So here's some stuff. We'll also get make this into a PDF so we'll be able to, you know, get this out to people if they need it. Um, here's some of the new stuff in 2.1. So a lot of what we're actually focusing on is giving you new objects. So things that you can put on your screen very quickly that will let you see. So here's some dials that really do work well. We have these full dials, these things I call donuts, um, you know, kind of like the Apple Watch thing about, you know, how many steps did you get in today versus how many you wanted to get in, um, lets you kind of see your progress towards a goal. Um, you know, having these be able to drag and drop on the screen. We also have this timeline view, uh, which is very helpful. So if you wanted to see, you know, shifts that it happened or maybe alarms or events that had happened over a timeline and see when they started and when they stopped. Or if you're making batches of a product and you want to see the phases of those batches and you wanted to see that on a timeline view, um, you know, very helpful that these things are kind of now out of the box, you know, here showing different phases of a production thing, you know, waiting or cooling or heating. And then at the top here, this is that um, web HMI content I talked about where you can actually go through and here is an alarm summary. So this could be an iFix or a simplicity alarm summary showing you your active alarms, right? By priority, right? You can actually go through and acknowledge them on this screen and see those alarms. You can actually build trends um, that will come in. And then also you can have screens that you'll be able to actually build and, and natively populate in here. So. That's kind of nice um, that you can actually build these things native and then you don't have to worry about using the thick clients version of these alarm summary and the, and the trend objects, but you can actually use the ones that are native here. So that's some of that stuff that we're gonna go through and we're gonna be able to show you during the demo. Here's kind of a blow up of, of what those HMI widgets look like. Um, so here's the alarm summary, right? You can see acknowledge page and acknowledge all. You can highlight any one of these alarms um, you know, the trend object and then also, you know, fully animated, um, you know, HMI type screens that you can use. Another thing that we added in here to our trend, um, we had some customers who said, this is great when we see the trend, but what we'd really like to do is be able to put in some limit indicators. So someone who maybe wasn't as familiar with this system was able to actually see not only what the current value is, but where maybe the alarm limits are or the threshold limits are so that they can actually see that on the screen. So if you have some kind of a PID loop or something else, and you have a target and you actually have upper and lower warning limits, maybe this could be a level or a speed or a temperature that you're trying to monitor um, or a humidity or you know whatever that is, those properties you can actually now put in these lines on the trend so you can actually see where you are. Am I under my lower limit, right, or am I not? Um, so that's another nice feature that we added to the existing trend object, which you can have. And now, as I mentioned, we have 2.1, which just came out um, you know, last month. And now we actually have 2.1 Sim 1 coming out. And again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to really build up this library 
of out of the box what we call widgets. So these things you can drag on the screen and you can actually go ahead and point at data and then they'll automatically, you know, turn into a useful graphic. Um, and some of these things are very HMI like, but a lot of these now are business things. So bar charts, right? Graphs, time view, right? Trend, the spider chart. So there's a bunch of different ones here that are kind of let you look at a data in a more high level, kind of maybe more of a business lens. You know, how was, how was my pumping efficiency going? Things like that. Um, one of the ones that's really important is the grid. Think of this like an Excel table. Um, and that's something that's going to be coming out, a new grid with more functionality in 2.1 Sim 1. And then, then there's already a bunch of enhancements that they're going to do that they're going to keep improving that grid. But imagine if you could have a grid where you could automatically say, just show me you know, the runtime hours on all my pumps. And it literally will just filter that um, for all of your pumps. And maybe you have five pumps or 10 pumps. And you could pick a region, and it will automatically filter down. Um, but that grid object being able to show a bunch of data and dynamically change from eight data sets to four to three to 12, depending on the query. And then maybe showing you your current status, you know, maybe the, you know, the volume or the efficiency over the last 24 hours, being able to show a bunch of metrics and change the color. So that's a grid object that we think is going to be, you know, super helpful going forward for people building out informational dis displays where people can kind of do ad hoc analysis. Uh, we also have, you know, some of the stuff like the Pareto charts where you can actually go ahead and build charts. So, you know, what does June look like versus July versus August? Um, you can actually see what your trends are in this bar chart type view. Um, so anyways, these are kind of some things that are coming out, uh, should be the end of August, uh, which again, will just be an easy upgrade um, from your 2.1, just to add this new widget library and to add these in. And again, they're all just included with your, with your license. Hey, Will, can I hit you with a couple of questions and we'll transition over to Greg and his demo? Perfect, yep. Awesome. Uh, so Mark was asking, he, he says he has iFix 6.5 running on a virtual machine. Um, you yep. know, how, how does that kind of sync up with what we're talking about today? So with 6.5, I mean, he'll be able to go through and, you know, if he also has a story and he can easily just put some of that historical data up there if you wait a little while, if he has web space on that iFix 6.5, he'll be able to start publishing his screen straight into OpSub where he can actually have those screens in OpSub and then also wrap other content, some of these other, you know, kind of dashboarding tools and other data sources around those existing screens. Um, but that's coming. And then I think even now, if he wanted to, he could start building out some of that web HMI stuff to kind of give this view um, using some of those new graphics. And this might now open it up that he could now show this to, you know, maybe a group of people who don't right now have access to the iFix system who okay. might want to be casual read-only users. Um, so there's a, a couple different options there for, for what he can do. Okay. Yeah. And we could get into that more in the workshop too. And then you kind of just answered this, but I'll, I'll ask just to, to, to pinpoint it. Uh, Jason was asking, so web HMI screens can be imported into OpSub 2.1? Yes. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I thought that would be the answer and probably yep. something that would be super convenient for people to do. Yep. So I think that's it. I mean, there's a, we can go into, you know, there's a certain tools or a certain palette of objects you want to use, you know, with web HMI, there is a limitation that you can't do your scripting and mm -hmm. pop-ups, but there's a whole bunch of nice stuff that you can just build. And if you're really comfortable inside that iFix environment, it does make it nice to build those screens really quickly and then still let them be displayed out here in OpSub. Cool. All right. Well, Greg, do uh, you want to join us here? And we'll start rolling into uh, the demo. Will, thank you for the presentation and for answering those questions at the beginning. I, I appreciate it. No problem. That's fun. And I hope, hope people can go into that kind of Q&A session afterwards and we can kind of do a deeper dive on some of these questions. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Greg, I'm going to, uh, you want to go ahead and share your screen and we'll get rolling. Yes, I'll do that now, Jeremy. Thank you. And thank you, Will. Like it's starting up. All right, you should see my screen momentarily. Yep. Looks good. All and right. just a quick note to folks, there is a plus minus on the right side of your screen. If you want to zoom in on anything Greg's showing you, you can do it that way. You can get a closer look. Perfect. Thanks, Jeremy. Yep. Um, yeah, so uh, a lot of you guys are familiar with the iFix application. And as some of you alluded, there's the iFix 6.5 release 
And that allows us to take advantage of what we used to call the web HMI environment, ability to see SCADA type graphics inside the Ops Hub environment. So um, I'm using the uh, iFix sample system right here on a virtual machine and that's running and I can use this to build some of the, the graphic mimics that you see in the uh, Ops Hub. Um, on the other side of that, I have a, another virtual machine running and this is my Ops Hub running. So this is Ops Hub 2.1 run, running in the uh, run environment. And uh, I am in Chrome and I have two tabs open. One is the designer environment and the second is the runtime environment. Um, when you build an application, uh, it will publish a URL for you and a QR code. So you can give the uh, end user just the runtime URL and that's what they would uh, see is your application. As part of the 2.1 release, as Will just mentioned, uh, a couple new widgets we're pretty excited about. There's really uh, a focus on uh, styling the application. So there's these new donut chart type widgets where you can see your threshold levels, uh, whether you're looking at a, a level, a pH, a temperature type of deal, um, as well as these have a really nice uh, uh, high performance look, as well as they provide a spark line. So as you see in many of these applications, if you're using high performance graphics, uh, indication of direction of your process um, is easily done by using these sparkline type trends. So this value that we're looking at is actually coming out of the historian. It's, it's near real time values and it creates a sparkline of the last two hours, 24 hours, whatever you uh, configure it as. Um, the other indicate, uh, indicator of the widget that we created here is the alarm uh, widget. So this is displaying my current alarm state. So I have three critical alarms, four high priority alarms, one uh, medium priority and eight informational alarms. So this was aggregating the alarm information out of iFix. So it's not a separate system. It's literally using OPC UA to grab data out of the iFix system. Uh, finally, down here at the bottom, you'll see this is the new event chart. It could be uh, as simple as uh, events like this is my pump cycles, when is my pump running and when is it not? And it will give you a quick indication of what your pump's been doing over a period of time. Uh, so very simple uh, to set this up and build this dashboard. I'll give you an example here in a minute. Hey Greg, uh, um, a, few, a few people are having trouble seeing your screen. Maybe try resharing it. I can see it. Okay, it looks fine to me. Um, but just see if maybe there's a way to okay. set uh, them. Stop sharing here. So I know Jeremy, we're kind of admins, and I can see it fine. Yeah. Is there anyone? Is there anyone who's a an attendee who? Yeah, there was one or two people who just said that it looked black to them, but yeah, we'll we'll see if we can do something. The other option is you could refresh your screen if you're having trouble seeing it, um, and re-enter the session and see if that clears it up. But um, we'll we'll do our best here. Mm -hmm. All right, it looks good, Greg, if you just want to keep rolling. And then those folks who are having, oh, it looks like that fixed it for at least one person. <laughs> Perfect. All right, thanks, Greg. Okay, yeah, uh, as I said, this is a, a glimpse of our uh, the 2.1 release and our new donut chart, and then our event chart down here at the bottom, as well as a spark line indicator as part of these new widgets. As Will said, the widget library is being built out in this 2.1 release. Everything I'm showing here is a release product. Uh, and then we have a Sim 1 coming out shortly that uh, has a host of other widgets that give us some uh, other visual um, indicators uh, that we can use within the Ops Hub environment. Uh, these widgets can display data from all sorts of data sources. So as Will said, uh, we're looking at either SCADA data, we could look at historian data, we could look at SQL data, uh, we can look at plan applications data. All that data can be um, tied to each of these types of widgets that you see here. Uh, Give you an example, over here on the right is our navigation bar. This gets pre-built for you as you build out content and you can also customize it as well. Uh, one thing I wanted to show you as part of this new donut chart, it has a bunch of different faces to it. So it's one widget, but by selecting uh, different properties, they can look at different 
bunch of different ways. So the top line here, the top two lines, this is actually real-time data coming out of iFix. And the bottom line is actually data coming out of the historian. You'll see it has a spark line associated with it. Um, the widgets also have indicators. So you can put spec indicators here. So I know my low limits, my high limits. And the widgets will also uh, can be used for alerts. So if the uh, value goes outside a normal operating range, the widget uh, will change color uh, to give you indication. So think about these as quick ways to see a dashboard of what your process is doing, okay? Unlike an iFix system where you have um, every aspect of your control system, this is a great application to, to monitor your application, whether you're on a phone, a tablet, or a web browser. Um, doesn't matter, it's easy to deploy either way. So that's a little uh, idea of what that might look like down here. We have a timeline of different sorts and we can actually pick up the event, the timeline and move through it that way. Um, going through some other displays here with the menu, uh, just to give you an example what some of the other widgets might look like. There are gauges and tanks and bar, bar charts, um, as well as as I drill into here, um, here's another timeline uh, event where I'm monitoring production, I'm monitoring what product I'm running, and I'm monitoring either the batch number or the downtime, whether the process is running or not. And then down here in the bar chart, I'm, uh, I'm uh, displaying my production rate. So this is my production rate over time. I have a goal of 1,000 as my target, and I'm quickly going toward that as, uh, as I run my process. So these are some of the tools that's used for. Uh, some, of the, some of the existing stuff that's been enhanced are the, uh, the historical analysis chart. So the historical analysis chart can be pre-configured. So as I go into the chart, it's automatically showing a particular uh, graph. I can also go in and add favorites. So I have a series of predefined favorites here and where I could go in and pick my uh, different uh, charts. So if I want to look at my temperatures, I could pick in my temperatures. And as I do that, it brings up my temperature chart pre-configured. I can add to this, you know, ad hoc. You know, this is a, a end user configurable um, chart. So I can do a bunch of things to hit this over the configuration. I can change my duration. Um, I can, uh, Put it in different modes. I can add pens here if I want to add new pens to the chart. This is all done right here through the uh, through the search filter, through my uh, food and beverage uh, search filter. So if I want to add additional, you know, I want to add what my uh, production rate, my um, I can just add that to my trend here, and then you can update your favorites if you wanted. So. This is, can be configured kind of in the design environment by setting up favorites, or you could just do an ad hoc uh, um, chart in runtime. So either way, it's built to work in both fashions uh, as a troubleshooting tool and a dashboarding tool. And uh, it has different layouts. So I can go into the chart, and this is a quad view layout using an asset model to populate the chart. So. Maybe you just want to display with all your charts. That that's how you run your process. You can do that as well. So a bunch of different features around that. Um, some of the other things that Will talked about was, hey, there's a new HMI capability in the product. And I'm going to go into my pasteurizer uh, application. And now what you're seeing here is you're seeing a graphic that was built in the iFix environment. And then... Um, imported into the Ops Hub environment. So what we're trying to do is leverage a lot of the content that you're already built in the iFix environment um, and get that into the Ops Hub environment for deployment there. You can certainly build uh, pages um, native for uh, Ops Hub with inside iFix. So something maybe uh, less complicated and just give users indication. And then down here at the bottom, you'll see that we have an alarm banner. And that alarm banner is interactive, so you can, 
you can go in here and acknowledge um, acknowledge alarms if you want. You can uh, uh, filter your alarms by different aspects. So you can filter by um, uh, source or severity, et cetera. So if uh, I only want to look at my critical alarms and it will then filter your alarm queue by that particular um, uh, severity. And then you can go into more of a full screen type alarm. So we've added that capability to visualize uh, simplicity in HMI screens. We've added the capability to do a full screen alarm banner. Uh, we also put the alarm counters in there as well as a number of new widgets. Um, now I'm in the designer environment. Let me show you a few, um, a quick example of how you might build an application. So this is the sample system that I just showed you. I'm going to just add a new page for this. And um, we're going to add a new page to my application. So um, here's a blank page in the Ops Hub environment. This is very similar to building a PowerPoint or an iFix screen. Uh, something of that nature. If you're in, familiar with those tools, you you got a good head start with uh, Operations Hub. Uh, first thing we do is we, with the layouts, we drop a couple containers on here. And I'll show you here in a minute that our containers um, allow us to lay out objects, particularly the widgets, and then they'll be responsive in design. So if I put this on a tablet and turn it vertically, it will rearrange the content and look um, look nice in a, in a vertical fashion. Uh, you have simple widgets like display widgets where I can simply drag a header on there and you can uh, set properties around that header. Maybe this is your, your this is uh, my process screen or something. And so there's your process screen. You can certainly style it a little bit by putting um, text on there and changing the font style and colors. You have access to do all that. Um, the other thing you do with these containers is you can change the visual layout of them. So if I want to put uh, more of a quad or six uh, layout, I can do that as well. So here I'm creating a grid of where my widgets are going to be. Um, so we're going to build, we built our first page. We got a, a title on it. Uh, as we go through this, we're gonna go into our integration here, and this is a series of tools. This is our, our new alarm card, our new uh, mimic card, and down here uh, we have our new display uh, donut chart. So we'll just drag a donut chart on there, good to go. Um, and then we're gonna populate that. You see over here we have a browser, and the browser allows us to browse the data source. We'll talk about hey, we can get data from iFix, we can get data from Historian, how do we do that? We can give it, get it from our equipment model, uh, we can get it from our Historian, we can get it from iFix. So as I, as I look through this, I can grab data from the different data sources. And this is all doing um, uh, information with your, um, um, with OPC UA, that's how this is all connected. So I'm gonna grab my juice level and drop it on there. And what that did is that bound my tag to that particular widget and save it. We're just gonna save that guy and then we're gonna run it. Um, so we built our first web page here, open the app and you'll see it opens a tab for you. And lo and behold, I got a little widget here for me. Um, if you wanna style this a little bit, I'm gonna go back in and I can change a couple properties of this guy as well. And maybe I give it a title. This is my uh, this is my uh, slurry level or something. And this might be my engineering units. Um, and you can set some, all sorts of parameters around that and change the identity of that if you want. Go ahead and, and save that. And once that's done, all you do is simply refresh your page here and I'll have some, some um, uh, engineering units and description here for that particular, um, particular widget. 
Uh, kind of moving on that, we'll have one more of these widgets, and this time we'll tie it to a historian value. So instead of iFix, I'm selecting historian here. Uh, and with historian, it's going to give me a tag list, and maybe I want to do a uh, something around my pump. So you can just dynamically uh, filter through here, and I'm going to grab my pump speed tag. I know I have some data coming in my pump speed, hopefully, if it's running. And I'll drop that onto my widget. Uh, we'll keep tight, give that a title as well. This is going to be my uh, my speed, and that might be a, a percent. And we'll change the identity of this particular widget right here. So quickly, I'll go in and change the way that will look and feel. And now we'll go back in and we have our pump speed and we have our slurry. And I'll go back into my uh, HMI over here. I'm going back into my iFix demo system. I'm using that as my data source. And we'll just go ahead and start up our process. So I'm not producing anything right now. And as I start my process, hopefully we'll go back into our environment and um, get some uh, speed indicator coming here in a second. There you go. Um, so very quickly, you can do that. And uh, Jeremy, do I have a few yeah. more minutes? I could show them the web HMI stuff or? We might need to save that for the workshop. Um, OK. Which we can do. Uh, we could kick things off that way. Uh, before we bring in Scott, I just want to hit you with uh, one or two questions here. Justin was asking, can web trend favorites be imported and used? Um, so no. no. Uh, yeah. the, the, to answer your question, not at this point. It's something that is in the works. So. Uh, the ability to do uh, global favorites, user favorites, import exports is is on the docket. Um, so, the answer to your question mm -hmm. today, no, coming, yes, yes, okay. And then Justin was also asking alarm and events only from iFix database or from any OPC AE. Um, as far as I know, it's from iFix. Okay. I could give that a test for you. I believe it's only for iFix right now. Right. And that's a good one maybe to, to think about more for the workshop as well. Um, but yeah, let's let's save that last demo piece um, uh, for the beginning of the workshop, Greg, uh, so people can look forward to that. And then, you know, we can get into some, some conversations and questions. But thanks for the demo, Greg. I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do come to the workshop. I'll show you a little bit more deep dive on how to build some content, as well as um, showing you the content displayed on an on an iPad. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Greg. I want to bring in Scott Christensen, our OT Cybersecurity Director. Scott, welcome to Empower Up. Hello. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. Good to see you today. Next uh, next fifteen minutes is all yours. Oh, aren't I lucky? Thanks, yeah. everyone. Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> so. Uh, for those who have seen this in the past, we've always kind of shown a little bit of different technologies and uh, how to address some of the different threats. So today I thought uh, kind of how do we approach securing an OT environment and what are the things we should take into consideration? So first we'll just kind of start off with, you know, what are the threat vectors, right? What are the things you should be worried about? Uh, so this comes from a survey from SANS Institute and it kind of prioritizes and asks a bunch of security people, you know, what should OT people be worried about when protecting their environment? So if you see that number one thing, devices and things that can't protect themselves. So to me, this screams all our fun little three-letter acronym devices, you know, VFDs, PLCs, RTUs, you know, all those, you know, simple computing devices that we constantly use in OT, things that I can't put antivirus on things that aren't designed around security. So you'll hear me use a phrase a lot. And the phrase I want you to think is, if I can't directly protect the device, what is my compensating control around the device? So what ways am I compensating for that risk? Uh, the next two internal and external threats, if you've ever seen any survey forever on security, those are almost always on there, right? So uh, the, the employee who clicks a link they shouldn't, opens up an email they're not supposed to, 
uh, the vendor who shows up with that fun little USB stick with all his new programming and uh, brought as well as all the viruses he brought from his last customer and puts it into your SCADA system. And all of a sudden now you've infected a bunch of machines. Uh, external threats, uh, to me, those are the what I call the headlines, right? So those are the ones we always hear about the big hacker. Uh, you, you, know, you hear about Colonial or Oldsmar or JBS. You hear, hear quite a bit about the external threats, right? The hackers who are trying to break into our networks, usually for financial gain, sometimes just because, uh, you know, what are the ways we want to protect? And the one I find most interesting is this fourth one. And the reason why I find it pretty interesting is I've been doing this 20 plus years. We never talked about ransomware five years ago, four years ago. It was really something that was the focus around IT environments, right? Healthcare, hospitals, banking, because of credit card and financial information, they always had to deal with ransomware. And what we saw happen with ransomware was they got better about protecting against it in other verticals. And so a lot of our attackers, they started thinking, you know, who's got big unpatched networks? Who's got flat environments? Uh, who, who would be more than likely to pay a ransom? And when you think about how much revenue gets generated out of operations, we became a nice juicy target for them. So now I kind of want to get, get into a couple of the things we hear is pretty common myths to protecting an OT environment. And probably the, the, the one that I start to see disappear, but used to be the most common one we hear is I have an air gap. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the concept of an air gap, air gap is my network is not connected to any other network. And a lot of times we used to hear this, we'd go inside and we'd say, well, yeah, I'm connected to the billing system or I'm connecting to the ERP or I'm connected to some other system that isn't in my network. So you've immediately then broken the air gap. And in fact, you know, uh, former director of uh, cyber for the DHS, you know, he said he'd never found an actual air gap uh, in the kind of hundreds that we've done. I could count on one hand how many we could really say are truly air gaps. But even if I, you know, fall into the assumption that you do have an air gap, you're you are disconnected from everything else. A lot of times what we see happen in defeating an air gap is something as simple as sneaker net. That vendor with that USB stick inserting it in, and now he's infected all your machines, even though they're a disconnected environment. And if you look at a lot of the very early attacks in cybersecurity, that's exactly what they did. They had these big air gap networks in the Iranian centrifuges, and they were still able to get malware into those environments. So something as low tech as sneaker net can easely defeat it. And I can also argue that that false sense of security you have, I can take advantage of that and the fact that you don't have visibility because you're disconnected. If you're not looking at that monitor, you may not know you're infected. And in fact, a lot of attacks they live in your environment for a long time, propagating around without doing anything malicious. So they just want to spread throughout your network when they finally go to pull the trigger and do some malicious act, like encrypting your data. They've been there so long that they've infected a ton of your systems. So a lot of times that disconnected, that lack of visibility actually is a hindrance to protecting your environment. The next one that's, uh, is easily probably the one I hear most common today is we're not the target that IT is. You know, it's 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 much more relevant that I protect my IT systems and that OT really isn't a, a main focus of attacks. Uh, if you really look at the 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 way cybercrime you know just exploded over the last year because of the pandemic, and the fact that most OT vulnerabilities, seventy percent, are remote executables. I can actually take advantage of a lot of the disconnect. I can take advantage of those remote executables and I can target OT networks. And in fact, while we think of engineering workstations, you know, those old Windows XP, Windows 7, those old operating systems, we think of those as, uh, as the only attack vector or the most common attack vector, and they are. Uh, what we've seen over the last uh, couple of years is we've seen a quite a few attacks. And in fact, about 38% go after things like PLCs and SCADA servers and non kind of traditional IT assets. So, you know, a good 38% of the time, they're actually going for ROT infrastructure. And then if you look at the, the kind of the sectors that get attacked most, right? Energy's number one, it's been number one for a long time in OT for attacks, just to the nature of the way uh, we operate these big distributed networks. Manufacturing started to become bigger and bigger, specifically ransomware started being very prolific, being spread across multiple different uh, you know, environments within manufacturing. And then 
you know, water is slowly started creeping up the last year. And I'd actually say that 6% is probably low once we get the numbers in for last year. I think we'll probably see water's probably in the du double digits now in a, a tax by sector. So what we're really seeing is kind of those three key, key critical verticals are seeing more and more attacks. And then kind of the last big myth I see uh, uh, that is probably the most common is that the risks are much higher in IT than OT. And I've actually had CISOs tell us that, that, you know, I'm much more worried about my IT systems versus OT. So what I want you to think about is if you were down for an hour, what would that cost? If you were down for a day, what would that be like? Now imagine if it was a week. Now, if you look at the tax over the last 24 months, You'll see that number two most common event is downtime to production. And number five is significant downtime to production. You know, I've seen water utilities that had to go back to manual process because they lost all their automation. They had to call people out of retirement. Uh, they had to bring on additional bodies and resources because they were going to be down for, you know, extended period of time over a week. Uh, and then if you start thinking about what does it cost you to be down if you're a manufacturer? If you're, what is at that production line's down, say for an hour, what does that look like? Uh, and the numbers on the right come from the Department of Commerce. So if you think about in the auto industry, it could cost fifty thousand dollars a minute for that production line not to be operating. Uh, if you're in uh, kind of F and B, the numbers are right around nine thousand to ten thousand dollars a minute. So if you really start looking at the impact of that downtime, in the same way you approach it's kind of uh, Man manufacturing, you know, uh, performance downtime, predictive maintenance downtime, uh, that any unexplained downtime is kind of a negative. You should treat cyber the same way. How do I mitigate the unexpected, unplanned downtime? So one of the things we want you to start thinking about is defense in depth. Uh, simple concept. If I have something I value, I don't want to rely on a single, single technology to protect it. Uh, this goes back from a military going back all the way to the times of the Romans. If they were building a base, if they were building a fortress, if they had something they wanted to protect, they the concept was, I don't want to rely on one method, right? You'll see barbed wire, you'll see walls, you'll see sentry turrets, you'll see gates, you'll see you know dogs, you'll see all these different technologies and different techniques to protecting what's inside, right? And that's I want you to think that same way when I start approaching protecting my critical infrastructure. Am I relying on one one thing to protect me because if I'm only relying on one thing as an attacker, all I have to do is beat that one item and I, I have keys to the kingdom. I'm inside. So what are the things you should look at, right? That's kind of the next. Cut. So luckily for us, we have something like the NIST framework. For those who aren't aware, NIST is, is comes out of the Department of Homeland Security and it's recommended best practices around protecting critical infrastructure. Uh, I'm a big proponent of the CSF. There's also NIST 800 if you want to get more detailed. But the reason why I like the CSF is it gives us this high level taxonomy, but it also gives us these five function areas. So if I'm looking to protect my environment, what are the five areas I should focus on? So I start off with identify. Can I identify my critical assets? Can I identify what data comes and goes out of my network? And if I do that, can I identify potential threats? So once I've started doing that, I can start planning my protections. You know, how do I protect the critical assets? How do I protect the data as it comes and goes? How do I prevent those threats from entering my network? Then as I'm going and I want to get more maturity, I'm starting to look at how do I actively detect an incident as it happens? The faster I can detect something, the faster I can respond, the faster I can mitigate, the lower the impact it'll be on day to day. And then it kind of comes into the next two categories, respond and recovery. And these are most overlooked traditionally in my in our view. You know, do I have a good response plan? Is everyone aware of what happens if an incident hits us? And then if I have to recover, what are my backups look like? Am I backing up just my data? Or am I also backing up my programming and, and application logic? You know, because if, if you gain back your data, but you don't have the process to keep going, it doesn't really help you. So making sure that you're backing up appropriately, everything is important. So when you start to plan all this together, the next question is kind of, how do I start? Well, typically what we would want to recommend is you start with an assessment. And the reason why an assessment's got value is first is I'm prioritizing all my risk. So I'm understanding where the threats are. And when we approach an assessment, we want to do it in kind of a, a three method scoring technique. So we want to be able to look at what, how do I measure up against the standard? 
How does my assets look from a component standpoint? And then lastly, anything that's identified as a risk in the first two, do I have a, a, a measurement of actual risk versus perceived risk? And that's how you typically approach. And then from there, you start putting together remediation and recommendations, ways to address those risks. How do I fix these things? How do I get a roadmap to compliance? And what's really important about this is you can also take this away and have a prioritization of how do I start protecting my network and where do I begin? And that, and that from a whole is pretty much uh, what I wanted everyone to kind of get an understanding of where do I start when it comes to cybersecurity? Jeremy? Scott, thank you. Really appreciate the the insights on just you know everything that's going on. I think it's easy to get caught up in the headlines, but like taking a step back and actually thinking about you know what's important, defense in depth, you know where to start, you know, the air gap issue. It just it helps it put it, it puts it in context. So, um, quick question from the audience. Yeah, yeah, we're going to make a recording of today's presentation today, but the workshops aren't recorded. Those are just live, and those are um, those are uh, interactive today. So that's why we really encourage you to join those. Um, so, uh, Scott, thanks for the presentation, and you can talk with Scott about what your cybersecurity, you know, thinking and needs might be in the workshop as well. So Scott's going to be heading up. Uh, a workshop that's going to be starting uh, right now, actually. And then also Will and uh, Greg are going to be talking more about OpsHub 2.1. So if you do want to talk with them, um, we just ask that when you sign on to that portal, enable your microphone and enable your, uh, your camera so that when we call on you, you can actually talk with us a little bit and we can make it more of a conversation. Um, you know, worst case scenario, your camera's not working for some reason, you can still use the chat. But the idea, since the platform gives us the ability to talk to each other, let's take advantage of it. Um, I say just to make it as much as close to in person as possible. So if you guys would click on your agenda links, um, just the same way you got here and join us in the workshops, we'll continue the conversation there. So thanks again, Scott, and we'll see you at the, uh, the cyber workshop. Sounds good. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay. Thanks. Hey everybody, thanks for signing into the workshop. We're gonna get rolling here in a second. It looks like we have Greg in the room and we'll look for Will as well. Um, you should have gotten a screen when you logged in that asked you to have permission to use your, let me make sure I'm in the right one. Hold on one second. All right. Nope, that's the wrong one. Okay, so if you're in this one, you, you wanna go over the workshop. 